Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Aware of the Wolf, Identifying Predatory Journals. This is the, I believe, the third session in our spring webinar series focusing on research as it relates to funding and publication. Thank you for attending today. We are happy to have you. My colleague, Glenn Benedict, will be presenting the content of this webinar. I'm Megan Kowalski. I am the Outreach and Reference Librarian, and I'll be handling the, excuse me, the logistics and the behind-the-scenes stuff. Um, if you have any questions at any time, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. We will also have time for recorded and unrecorded Q&A at the end of the session. Anyone who registered today will receive the recording of this session uh, probably later today once it goes up on our YouTube page. So take it away, Glenn. Hello, and welcome to our presentation, uh, Beware the Wolf, Identifying Predatory Journals. Uh, it's like Megan said, hello, welcome. My name is uh, Glenn J. Benedict. I am the Access Services Librarian uh, here at UDC. Um, so I guess to start with, I just want to talk about uh, what is a predatory journal. And so you may have heard other terms like uh, predatory publishing or uh, dark publishing, deceptive publishing, um, uh, terms, terms like that. So what we're talking about when we talk about predatory journals. And there's a lot of different definitions. Um, one that I really liked that came from, uh, there was a group of scholars that met, uh, and they published their findings as a comment in the journal Nature uh, in 2019. Um, and so their definition was, uh, predatory journals and publishers are entities that prioritize self-interest, uh, that bolding in, uh, that you see there is, is, my, is uh, my formatting, at the expense of scholarship and are characterized by false or misleading information, deviation from best editorial and publication practices, a lack of transparency, and or the use of aggressive and indiscriminate solicitation practices. Um, so there's what you'll, um, over the course of this presentation, one of the things I kind of want to impress upon you is that uh, this is a very fluid definition. Notice the, the and or in that definition. Um, so just because um, there's going to be a lot of sort of like red flags and checklists um, that we're going to be talking about. And one thing to keep in mind is that just because an individual journal or an individual publisher meets some of these criteria. We're not considering them to be, they might not necessarily be a predatory in the way that we're talking about here. Um, one thing that the scholars that published the comment in Nature uh, stated was that uh, it is possible for a journal to fall short of you know, sort of editorial standards or you know, scholarly standards not out of, uh, um, you know, maybe due to lack of funding, they may not be recognized on certain lists because they have not been uh, publishing for that long. Like there, there are certain lists of, you know, quote unquote quality journals that uh, you have to be, uh, a journal has to be in publication for over a year. So if you find a journal and it's just starting out and it looks good, it looks promising, but you don't find it on certain lists, that may be a reason. So the um, one kind of main thing I want you to take away from this is that this is a very sort of fluid changing topic and you really need to kind of keep your eyes um, and ears out and sort of do your due diligence when it comes to uh, you know, sort of uh, evaluating uh, a journal or a publisher before you submit your uh, your hard work and your research to. Uh, so, what is the problem with these uh, these predatory publishers, these predatory journals? So, a big thing is that research published in these uh, by these publishers in these journals is going to be perceived to be of a lower quality. Um, due to lower or even in sometimes lack of editorial or peer review standards. Um, this damages your professional reputation. It damages your uh, possibility of tenure. Um, it's not um, sort of the best platform for the work that you have put into doing your research. 
Additionally, these journals, uh, because they are operating on a uh, uh, on a on a model and a publishing model that is more about profit than it is about uh, scholarship or um, or academic standards. Uh, you know, there is financial exploitation of the researchers um, because they know that you know the the academic model you know publish or perish. They know that there is a big demand for places for scholars who are looking to get tenure, who are looking to advance in their career. And so there is a uh, financial exploitation that happens there. So there are fees to submit. Uh, now, again, this is not uh, unique to predatory publishers. This is a problem sort of throughout the entire uh, academic publishing ecosystem. But in many cases, in addition to uh, these submission fees, there are hidden costs. One, uh, one you may be surprised by is that there might be fees to withdraw your research or uh, to get back um, uh, intellectual property rights to the research that you have submitted. So uh, being aware and being diligent of looking up what, uh, how are they charging? What, how are they making their money? Um, is an important thing to do. Uh, and next thing is because these publishers are, because they have these lower standards, they are publishing material that is not of good quality, that is not rigorous, that is not uh, meeting high standards, which has an impact on the public. Uh, their perception of academia, researchers, science, um, et cetera. Uh, you know, does these, um, you know, whenever you kind of one of the most common things I think a lot of people have heard in especially the last three, you know, two or three years, but even going further back is uh, when talking about, uh, you know, junk science or pseudoscience or uh, controversies in medicine is, you know, people will say, well, studies have shown. And so the question is, you know, what studies are they talking about? And are these good studies? You know, what is the, um, what is, um, you know, is just because something is published in a journal does not necessarily mean that that is good uh, content. And so these predatory journals, uh, because they are willing to publish and they're not providing that uh, editorial or peer review standards, um, there is stuff that is going out into the public consciousness that damages sort of the, the reputation of uh, research and uh, you know, scholarship in general. Uh, so again, talking about those hidden fees, uh, you may be familiar with some of the hoaxes um, that have come out. Uh, if you remember back in the mid nineties, there was the so-called hoax or the so-called uh, controversy, which was a uh, a science professor submitted a uh, an intentionally bad uh, article to a publisher that dealt more in sort of like uh, in literature or more in, more of the humanities um, to sort of expose um, the poor standards that um, he believes that was uh, showing up in sort of these. Uh, uh, these types of journals. Uh, additionally, uh, there's a, a SciGen, which is an, uh, an AI that can generate sort of uh, a scientific paper out of sort of technobabble. Um, and the researchers use that to create a bunch some, a, a false article and submitted them to a bunch of journals. And some of those uh, fake uh, articles and um, fake research was accepted for publication in several of these uh, predatory publishers or even uh, even predatory conferences. Um, and finally, the last thing that um, is uh, for scholars who are not in a uh, sort of Western context. So if you're not in the US or in Europe, uh, there is a similar standard, but there is a perceived uh, 
when whether this is uh, real or false, and they may, if there is a point here, that uh, research and scholarship that is coming from these non-Western uh, orientations is devalued in the West, and so therefore they have to turn to their own local publishers, which may again may be they have this uh, maybe <clears throat> uh, predatory on those uh, populations. So a lot of these uh, predatory publishers, for example, are uh, based out of Africa and Asia, because just like um, in sort of the Western sphere, there is a, a similar publisher parish imperative, but because they don't have access to Western journals because uh, there is a perceived uh, lack of quality coming from those parts of the world, good scholars are unfortunately turning to these predatory journals, which are stepping in to fill the need. Um, and so at the bottom here, I just say, um, there have been some people who would, would uh, criticize the concept of predatory journals, of instead of it being uh, these predatory publishers being a parasite on the academic ecosystem, um, they're really acting is more, it's more of a symbiosis uh, that, they are filling a need created by the publish or perish model. So um, they are using the scholars who need to publish, but the scholars are also using the fact that, you know, they can get into, they can publish their work in these journals. Um, so it's something to keep in mind that, you know, like I said, this, this is not 100% a clear cut, this is good, this is bad but being aware of what are the risks when getting involved with these sort of publishers. So one of the bad things is that, unfortunately, uh, like I said, because these are so fluid, there really is no authoritative master list of these are, you know, quote unquote, legitimate journals, and these are, quote unquote, predatory journals. Um, there have been lists that have been generated uh, some one of the most famous ones is Beale's. Uh, Beale is was a uh, librarian, I believe, working at the University of of Colorado uh, system. He created a list of um, and really was one of the people who was really pioneering uh, and highlighting the issue of predatory journals. Um, his list uh, ceased operation in 2017. Uh, I believe the website is still up and somebody is still uh, updating the list. Um, but, you know, again, there is a lack of transparency uh, in, in that list. So just, just be aware of that. Uh, addition, uh, Cabell's, which is a sort of data analytics company, they maintain uh, a list of verified and predatory journals. Those lists are uh, paywalled. So, you know, another sort of obstacle uh, to access. Uh, there's also, you know, as another example, the Directory of Open Access Journals, which they do their own vetting of journals. Uh, but as you can tell from uh, this chart here, that the DOAJ verified are on the Beals or Cabells or both lists of predatory journals. So again, it just sort of goes to highlight um, in terms of, uh, there really is no substitute for doing your own due, gil due diligence in analyzing uh, these journals or these publishers. Um, so that is something that unfortunately uh, that you'll need to be aware of. Um, so let's say you have your research, you are looking at publishers, at journals, um, what are some red flags that might stand out when you are doing your due diligence? Uh, so some of the ones uh, is when you're researching the publisher, do they provide false misleading information? Um, information about their editorial boards, uh, who is on it? Um, do they represent themselves as being indexed um, in a particular place or do they have to claim membership of certain associations? that you can't verify on the association's webpage? Uh, do they claim an ISSN um, 
or misrepresent their ISSN uh, and when you follow up uh, on that. So it is all important things to look at, you know, when you're looking, just you can get that right from the publisher's webpage. Uh, uh, another thing is a lack of transparency surrounding their peer review process. And again, going back to the editorial boards, so who is on it, what do they do? Um, when you pay, when you pay your submission fees, what the expectation is that those fees, what you are getting for them is that peer review, is that editorial oversight? Are you getting it? Um, do you know what the process is? for the peer, their peer review process. Um, the more questions you can ask and the more information you can gather, uh, the more secure you can be in terms of whether or not you're submitting to a uh, legitimate publisher. Again, is there, do they have a history of being financially uh, exploitative? Are there hidden fees? Uh, what rights do you retain to your research when you submit? Um, these are important questions to ask. Uh, and finally, um, are they aggressive in terms of when they are um, soliciting submissions? Do they, you know, send out a, uh, you know, cold call people? Do they send out emails to everybody in your department? Do the emails contain, you know, spelling errors, basic information that's wrong? You know, do they call you by the wrong title? Do they call you doctor if, even if you don't have a doctorate? Um, all things to keep in mind and to look out for. Again, not saying that if any of these pop up, that they are for sure a predatory journal, but the more red flags that accumulate, the more um, you would want to be very secure in terms of, do I trust this publisher with my research? And so uh, because of these problems, a number of Sort of publishers and academics um, have sort of come together and they've created the, uh, the Think, Think, Check, Submit uh, initiative, uh, which you can go to at thinkchecksubmit.org. And so uh, this is a very sort of basic checklist that you can use to go through. Um, but on the website, each of these bullet points has even more bullet points um, to check. So when you're thinking, are you some, so think about, are you submitting your research to a trusted journal? And is it the right journal for your work? Another uh, a sort of characteristic of these predatory journals is that the scope is very big because if they're willing to accept submissions on all sorts of topics because they're not really concerned with doing due diligence, due diligence in terms of their, uh, their own editorial oversight. Um, is this something, is this a journal that you and your colleagues have ever heard of? Again, could be a new journal, could be, you know, very new, uh, could be something very exciting. Um, so I don't want to scare people away from a new publishing initiative or a new, or a new journal, but at the same time, there is risks involved. Um, so can you identify and contact the publisher? Again, going back to the art, is there transparency in terms of peer review? Uh, are the articles from this uh, publisher indexed or archived in other places? Again, this is not uh, a foolproof method of checking. There are, you know, predatory journals and predatory publishers that have been indexed and archived and collected in databases that primarily contain legitimate scholarship. So you um, need to keep an eye out. Uh, are there, is it clear what fees are charged? Um, are there guidelines provided for authors? And are they part of a recognized industry initiative? And like I said, on the thinkchecksubmit.org website, there are further um, you know, things to look under all of those bullet points. So if you think the answer to almost all of these is yes, then you know, you're as sure as you can be and go ahead and submit. Um, if you have 
concerns or doubts, it might be time to either dig a little deeper, see if you can find out the answers to those questions, um, confer with colleagues, um, or you know, move on and find a different publisher. So, uh, you know, thinkchecksubmit.org. Uh, they have a lot of great information about this. All right, and if you have any further questions, um, uh, you know, reference librarians are available. And I guess, are there any questions? Oh, you're muted, Megan. Thanks, Glenn. <laughs> Feel free to unmute yourselves, just like I figured out how to do, or uh, put your questions in the chat. We'll also have time for unrecorded Q&A at the end. Right, not seeing anything come in. I just want to add that I have added a feedback form to the chat, and we would love your uh, review of this session and any notes you may have on things you'd like to see the library to provide through our webinars moving forward. Again, I'd like to thank you for attending today, and the recording will be posted on our YouTube page this afternoon, and you will receive an email about that. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.